Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston with our Blooming Catholic Life and I'm here for a book review and a book you probably haven't heard of. Well, it was really just published and it's one of those print on demand books. So it has that velvety cover, Ecce Agnes Dei, Behold the Lamb of God by Michael Murphy. He's a parishioner at my church. Let's read a little bit more from the back cover about him. He's a native of Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. He's a retired U.S. Navy Master Chief Petty Officer a parishioner and member of the Scala and Choir at my church. And he is also a member of the Third Order Augustinians at the Priory of Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Charlestown, West Virginia. Additionally, Mr. Murphy is a past Grand Knight of the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Council, 7612 Knights of Columbus. And it says that the book is published by St. Anastasia Press. I'm going to hold this up for you because there's a QR code involved. So if you're not sure about the book now, but you end up deciding you want it, you come just watch it again and you'll get this QR code here and you should be able to get it. Um, let's open up inside. It does say copyright 2023 by Michael Murphy. Da, 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 da. The picture is a monstrance, 1860 by Anonymous Public Domain. First publishing was September 2023. Let's read the beginning here. It says, um, the readers begin the cherubic hymn. Let all mortal flesh keep silent and stand with fear and trembling and meditate nothing earthly within itself. For the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Christ our God, comes forth to be sacrificed and to be given food, given for food, to the faithful, and the bands of angels go before him with every power and dominion, the many-eyed cherubim and the six-winged seraphim covering their faces and crying aloud the hymn, Alleluia, 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 for the divine liturgy of St. James. Um, there's another quote here from St. Ambrose of Optina. You can see that the book uses the footnote system because they're right here on not even the first page, really, right? It doesn't say what this is. Is this an introduction? What is it? I don't know. It's just a random page with two quotes that are cited. Then a blank page. Then it says scripture references within this book, except when referenced by other authors. Most Old Testament passages are direct translations from the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh, the canonical collection of Hebrew scriptures. The numbering of the Psalms follows the Septuagint text used in the Second Temple, Judaism, and many modern translations. Except when referenced by other authors, most New Testament passages are direct translations from the 27th and 28th editions of the Nestle Oland Novum Testamentum Gracie, Greek New Testament, a critical edition of the New Testament in its original Conine Greek. I'm just going to hold that up for you because it's a little complicated for me <laughs> oh, in pronunciation another blank page and then table of contents here we have it it is in the format that we like mostly except you can see there's many subheadings but the main headings just have that number i kind of wish those big things would be in bold um you can see there's several levels of indention so possibly some other differentiations would be nice to have there. How many pages is the bold contents? It's one page front and back plus about a quarter of another page. Um, let's go ahead and look what that table of contents has in it. You're probably really curious by this point. Um, it starts out with an introduction on page one. So it still doesn't tell us what that earlier quote section was. Two, the foretelling of the Eucharist in the Old Testament. And it has Melchizedek, Moses, the gathering, tabernacle sacrifice. And in under that, we have the bread of the presence and the blood of the lamb. On the Todah sacrifice, we have Passover, bread, wine, lamb. In the Exodus, Elijah, Elisha, the Psalms, Ezekiel. Summary. Oh, I would have thought those would have been different levels. Sorry. Three is the New Testament, which has Gospels, Act of the Apostles, Epistles, and the Revelation to St. John. Four is the Early Church Fathers and other Christian writers, and it has Introduction to the Church Fathers, St. Clement of Rome, St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Justin Martyr, the Didache, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, St. Serapion of Antioch, 
Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of church fathers here. It does end up with St. Hildegard von Bingen and Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. So there's a bit of a jump there in time. Oh, St. Leo the Great is in, uh, quite a mix in time over time. Uh, then we have St. Thomas. Number five is St. Thomas in the Summa Theologica. Um, introduction, advice on how to read Thomas Aquinas. Then it has questions 30, 70, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77. Then we have number six, the conclusion, which includes the veiled Christ, Christ unrecognized after his resurrection, Christ revealed, the doctrine of the real presence, prostrema verba, bibliography, and the illustration credit. Then we have here um, a page of acknowledgments. Doesn't say that, but it is. Um, thanks to Mr. Andrew Turner, Reverend Mr. Brian Krim, St. Leo Catholic Church, Inward, West Virginia, and Reverend Mr. Joe Slattery, St. Joseph Catholic Community, Eldersburg, Maryland, for their pre-publication review. This book greatly benefited from their valuable input. So now we're going to look at technical features. It does have the title of the book. Up till now, it's had just the title of the book on both pages, but you can see here it has introduction. So let's see if it continues that pattern. Yes, book table on the left, and... It appears as though it's going to be the main topic then on, remember those things that were numbered in the table of contents? That's what's going to be on the top of the right hand page. The page numbers are in the outside bottom corners exactly where I like them in books. Um, although this is going to be pretty much a sequential book, but because you're probably going to refer back to it, I'm um, having the page numbers there are going to make it easier. The print, I would say, is a little bit on the small side just because there's so much text. Um, and the footnotes are in a different font. Were they in a different font from the beginning? And I didn't notice. I apologize. Um, where's that very first page that had a footnote? Golly. <laughs> the pages are sticking a little bit. Uh, it was. It was just so much I didn't even notice. But here it's quite obvious that it is a different font down there. So it helps you tell. Now you have the line plus the different font to help you out there. Um, okay, and that is actually a YouTube video is the first one, interesting. It's the introduction and it tells you because that video actually inspired him to write the book. So very interesting. Um, the introduction is just a couple pages, but I wanna show you roughly five pages. I want to show you some of the Greek in the book so you can look at that. So he is going to show you the Greek words actually written out. Um, it does remind you that if you like the book, please review it on Amazon. You know, he's an independent publisher, so he needs that help if you like the book. Um, here are some of the a version of the images and you can see how the new section is starting easy to see there's a new section starting for one thing the title changes up here but two it is here bolded and numbered as well um, here is a list so you can see how he treats lists um, subheading so some of these looked like they were going to be really large sections but they're really not are they they're not. Um, let's see here. Lots of footnotes, though. Lots and lots and lots of footnotes, which is really great. Scripture references do appear to be mainly at the bottom. Trying to just scan. Some are mentioned in the text, but I'm not seeing parenthetical. Oh, no, there is a parenthetical citation as well. Okay, this little guy, I don't know why this little one here is so small, right? Pass it. Passover. Are the other headers right before it also is small? No. Oh, no, there are other ones. That's just one of those levels. So, like, underneath the tabernacle sacrifice, it has a tiny one there. Hi, friends. Sorry about that. I had to grab the door quick. So, those are um, the only things I'm really seeing in the book. Um... Also, on the section with St. Thomas Aquinas, the response to the objections are numbered out, easily to see in bold. 
let's get to some of the content now. Let's just randomly pick one. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm saying um a lot. I'm really distracted from having to run and get the door. I do apologize. You can tell it's gotten dark in the meantime. It's very weird. Um, a little bit harder to see out here. Let's look. What do we have by St. Hilary of Portiers? This is on page 43. And it says the Trinity, and it takes us immediately to a footnote. St. Hilary of Portiers, like his master, was a disturber of the peace and a gentle and courteous defender of Christ's divinity. He wrote some of the best Trinity. That's what it says, Trinity. I would have written Trinitarian. That's why I was cut off. Trinity theology. His scholarship and controversy showed his holiness in a very troubled church. He was the Bishop of Poitiers in France. Okay. Um, and it says 8, 14. I guess that's... I don't understand that format. It's in brackets. I'm guessing he's listing a document they have and then the citations from the document. That's my guess. Let me show you that. Um, because it's in a number of them. So uh, does this one have it? See, in brackets, but it's a book right after him. So we can, let's jump back a little bit and see if we can see that described at the beginning of this section that he's going to use this format. The introduction. I don't see where he described what he's doing or what. I, I've i never seen that particular format. Um, that's interesting. Because look at the one I'm using. It has the name of the thing and then the title and then this, the footnote number. But some of... And then <laughs> his dates. Some of them, though, have that footnote number. Um, see, is after the citation number. And then some... Like over here, it's after the document. So I don't, I don't know if that's just an inconsistency or showing us something different. I don't know, but apparently he lived about 356 to 359. For and this is a, a direct quote. Oh, is this entire thing a quote? If so, this is a very long quote. Um, we wouldn't normally have such a long quote. I. Mm, I kind of get why he did it for this section, but I wish he maybe he would have paraphrased things. But let's see. These, oh, these all seem to be enormous quotes taken straight from the books. Well, that's something. It's interesting then because, um, again, that would depend on translators. So you normally would say more than just that, but I don't see. Maybe it's in the bibliography, I bet. Let's jump back to the bibliography and see if it tells us what translations he's using for those documents. Um, no. No. Ah, ah, yes, I'm guessing. Because like here is Ambrose et al. Niacine and post-Niacine Fathers of the Christian Church, a select library of a new series translated into English with prolegomena and explanatory notes. Sorry, ambulance. Parker, 1891. So he is probably t lifting these directly from a book. Um, that's a translation. So it does tell you in the back. I'm supposing that's where that comes from for that translation. Interesting. Really not many resources back here in the bibliography. This one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now some of those are anthologies or collections. So that's what that's about. And then there's only actually one illustration credit in the back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let's get to that reading. I promise you content here. And then I didn't read it because I was confused by that. So for as to say, for as to what we say concerning the reality of Christ's nature within us, unless he has taught us. See, it's kind of awkward because again, that translation would have been done in 1891. I'm guessing from that. That book citation. Um, and so that's a little awkward. Let me try again. For as to what we say concerning the reality of Christ's nature within us, unless he has taught us, our words are foolish and impious. For he says himself, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. John 6, 55-56 There is no room for doubt regarding the verity of the flesh and blood. For now, both from the declaration of the Lord himself and our own faith, it is verily flesh and verily blood. And these, when eaten and drunk, bring it to pass that both we are in Christ and Christ in us. Is this not true? Yet they affirm that Christ Jesus is not truly God are welcome to find it false. He therefore himself is in us through the flesh and we in him, while that which we are with him is in God. Okay, so yes, that is an older sounding translation with more archaic language. So sometimes it's going to be confusing and you may need to read it through a couple of times to get that. Um, I wish he said why he included it, but he literally just included what that church father said. And you can kind of respect that. I just feel like I would like some sort of summary or something there. Um, because a lot of it was a Bible quote, too. Um, we can look up. Well, let's not look at another early. Oh, the early church father seems to be a larger section there. Okay. Um, like Aurelius Prudentius Clemens is just this little bit here. So some of them can be page after page after page. Who is the one before? Many pages on whoever this is. Oh, St. John Christendom has a lot of pages. And that includes homily 46 on the Gospel of John. Which this seems, it is all one giant quote. Oh, that's a little... Okay. I think it's all one giant quote, but it's like five or six pages. So that that's not a choice I would make. Uh, again, that's interesting. Um, no, it's several. It, it's a series of excerpts from homilies. It's a series of them. Okay. I see that now. It's, it's just kind of small because there's not like a double space when it's a new section. Uh, let's see if we can find it. So there's one. See, it just looks like it's right in the text. And if you come down to here, here's another one. Uh, double spacing the lines there may have made it easier to find the next one. So that's interesting. Using the italics when you have that extra gap makes sense because you see it. But when it's in a, a big block of text like that, this is what I mean about it being a small type of print for that much text. It's, it's a lot when it's like that. Um, so how, this may just really be more of an anthology, a collection of other people's writings. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking each chapter has an introduction and a conclusion, but it seems like then it's a lot of direct quotes. So, Even when it's talking about, like, in the Exodus, it's it's a lot of huge quotes. But not all of them are quotes. He has some extra paraphrasing and things there. So the conclusion is on page 137. There are a total in the text, total of 145. So it's like most Christians believe the Bible is divinely inspired and free from error. Likewise, evangelicals generally affirm that the Bible and the Bible alone is inspired by God and is the final authority on matters of faith and practice. Pope Paul VI defended the petition, position of the Catholic Church in the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, De Verbum, on November 18, 1965. Since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error, that truth that God wanted to be put into sacred writings for the sake of salvation. Since God speaks in sacred scripture, again, another giant quote from, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and skip. And it says the New Testament is present in all or part in more than 5,600 Greek manuscripts, more than 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and perhaps 500 other manuscripts in various languages. It's really just... No, I don't know. I, I don't. He's just telling the extent of the original documents that we have on it. Uh, four different accounts of Christ's life in the Bible. Talks about the catechism. 
Ah, finally, almost a page side and back. I think we really get to the meat of his conclusion here. Similarly, if every family member were required to write a family history, they would tell the same tale. Nevertheless, each family member would also draw attention to specific facts that he felt were significant while considering the intended audience for the family history. But the holy writers did it, quote, in such a way that they have told us the honest truth about Jesus, they said. Where's that from? I don't see a citation for that one, so I don't know where that came from. It's difficult to say whether the final version of our Gospels is the saints' exact word-for-word -word composition, but our tradition does connect the saints to their respective Gospels. In a letter written by St. Papias, circa 130, Bishop of Heropolis, St. Mark, who is identified with John Mark of Acts 12.12, 12, and the Mark of 1 Peter 5.13 is mentioned. When Mark became Peter's interpreter, he wrote down accurately, although not in order, all that he remembered of what the Lord had said or done. And that's in quotes. We don't really know what that letter is unless it's in the, site, the bibliography. There's no footnote there either. This identification was backed up by St. Arrhenius, who died in 203, and Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215, commonly considered to have occurred between the years of 65 and 70, just after the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, is the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> so it's still a little bit rough, um, but it's, it's a huge resource even if you just used it as a resource to get you started, he has compiled a great number of resources on the Eucharist. Um, just using these and their citations in the main body of the text, you could do a great study on the Eucharist yourself, looking them up for yourself. And then you can always use the bibliography in the back. So he has done a huge amount of research here. I may disagree with his style of writing in uh, I think maybe the conclusion could be summed up a little quicker. And then the citation doesn't, the conclusion doesn't seem to have the citations that I would want it to have. But the rest of it is chock full of citations and scripture. So it's a huge amount of research in here. I think you're going to find it as a great resource for the study on the Eucharist because of the amount of research and what he's compiled in here. Um, so friends, that's my peek inside Ecce Agnes Dei by Michael Murphy. Friends, may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. And may the good Lord bless you. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.